Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming on this last full day of winter. <laughs> Hopefully, we can usher in some of the warmth of the Azores here uh, so that we can get a little, although I expect, I hear we're getting snow tomorrow, so this is a little insane. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, and we have an esteemed guest with us. We have the Consul of New Bedford, uh, co the Portuguese Consul of New Bedford, Pedro Canheiro. Thank you, Pedro, for coming. He's going to correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, I see in the audience a lot of experts here. Uh, uh, many of our docents are here. And to Sarah's point, um, if you and they're, they're, you can ask them lots of questions. They and they'll correct you too um, in in lectures, but. There is a great camaraderie among the, the docents and volunteers at the Whaling Museum, so if you have spare time, just to reiterate Sarah's plug, it, it's, it's not only about volunteering um, and community service, you, you, um, you gain a lot of new friends too, don't you? I mean, I, I, I mean there's a real enrichment for, for folks. So, um, so with that plug, uh, and. Uh, Sarah mentioned I'm a card-carrying member of the Old Dartmouth. I am. The Old Dartmouth Historical Society, for those of you who don't know, which was founded in 1903, is the governing body of the Whaling Museum. They started the museum, actually, in 1903. Um, they were sort of the children of the whaling captains and agents. By 1903, uh, New Bedford was, you know, a, a major, like Fall River, uh, a major textile uh, center. Um, Manufacturing Center. Wamsutta Mills was here. Berkshire Hathaway was here, uh, and uh, and uh, they saw their they saw their city changing rapidly, and an influx of immigrants from just about every country coming in, and it was no longer this bucolic Yankee seaside town. And they decided, like many towns across the U.S. at the turn of the century, we have to we we have to somehow preserve uh, what we know of our own history. And so they pooled their collections, the paintings in the great houses along the spine of County Street and, and their books and libraries. And, and other, other, actually a very, very early um, learning society in New Bedford, which dates to 1828, the New Bedford Lyceum, uh, which was like a second, really like a second lecture series. It was a lifelong learning series uh, of lectures that you could attend at Liberty Hall, which was up the street at the time. Uh, long gone, but um, Lincoln, uh, uh, lectured there, Melville did, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, and you could go there and learn. And, uh, and so uh, even the Lyceum bequeathed its library uh, and scientific equipment and its collections to the old Dartmouth Historical Society when it sort of faded out of existence um, in the late 19th century. Uh, so the museum's roots in the community go way, way back. and. Uh, I'd been a member here from early on, early 80s. This was the only place, and it remains one of the only places, um, locally certainly, where you could come and learn about local history from published authors, from um, historians and scholars from around the world. Uh, and uh, it was sort of like, a, a, like a, a little university in that regard, which is why I came and, uh, and have not stopped coming. Now I'm a member of the staff for a few years, but. Uh, I'm awed in that I, I have an institutional history that goes back a generation. Uh, but anyway, uh, a, a, a disclaimer on this, I, uh, and I'm going to speak extemporaneously, try to eat, despite the tie, casually to you, um, and try to keep it interesting. If, if a question strikes you that I hope I can answer, uh, by all means, just raise your hands. I'll, I'll lower the lights a little bit so we can see this more clearly. And for those of you who want to take a snooze, you can do that too. So, um, no, but seriously, um, uh, uh, just a disclaimer, uh, much of uh, the images in this PowerPoint uh, are part of a presentation that our president, James Russell, made uh, on the West Coast not too long ago about this very subject. So rather than reinvent the wheel, I've added to it and augmented it. Um, uh, currently, there's a traveling exhibit that the Whaling Museum has issued, uh, which is um, 
being exhibited on the West Coast at several venues related to this, uh, to this story, to this narrative, because as you may know, um, the, uh, the Portuguese community, there are, there are very strong uh, and large concentrations of Portuguese communities, Portuguese heritage communities in, in the United States, the West Coast, San Diego in particular, uh, where uh, this narrative is particularly uh, interesting. And uh, we want to get the word out about this connection uh, in, in, for many reasons. Uh, but uh, it is a teaching moment about how maritime people interact, uh, and, uh, and it can be applied prac practically globally. Um, I, I, the research involved, again, not my research, uh, Michael Dyer, a senior maritime historian, was involved. Uh, in some of the grant applications related to the historical research that, uh, uh, that the gallery uh, required uh, before its assembly. And, uh, and the other disclaimer is, um, well, it's not really a disclaimer, it's that this was in the making for a very long time. You can see that plaque on this first, um, uh, you know, on this first slide. Uh, the gallery was actually, uh, the, the genesis of the gallery was a gift from the government of Portugal. Uh, and it came in the form of half a million dollars at about 1998. It took the museum more than a decade uh, to assemble it. Uh, and it's still sort of a work in progress. It takes up more than half of the central core of the museum in the Bourne building, where our largest exhibit, the whale ship Lagoda, is. So it's at the heart of the museum, and the Azorian story is really at the heart of, of the New Bedford whaling story. Um, and there's some several good reasons for that. And uh, I have a show of hands before I lower the lights. How many uh, here have at least some Portuguese ancestry within their own families? So a few, yeah? I'd say what? It looks like about maybe 15 to 20 percent. And how many from New Bedford, uh, Dartmouth, Fairhaven, Westport? Westport? Okay. So you're all within what was called Old Dartmouth. That's why Old Dartmouth Historical Society is called that, because all of this area, New Bedford, Cushnet, Dartmouth, Fairhaven, and Westport, they were all Dartmouth once in, in the 1660s, uh, set off from Plymouth, uh, which is why the society is called Old Dartmouth. Uh, but chances are, if you have Azorian uh, or Portuguese um, ancestry as part of your family heritage, uh, it could be probably in part due to whaling. Um, in my case, and I'll mention this, uh, uh, my family came over in the second wave after whaling uh, during the textile era. So here's the Whaling Museum, that's the Bourne building I talked to you about, the central core of the museum. We take up a whole city block, uh, 20 galleries. Uh, it's been growing since 1903. The collection is in excess of 750,000 objects. So it's a global, uh, of a global scale. And of course you see it looks out over the harbor, which is still the number one commercial fishing port in the United States. And the Azorian Whaleman Gallery is within the main core of the um, of the, uh, of the complex. Uh, but I'd like to dispel a myth that because it was an old Yankee establishment, uh, you know, the, the museum and the society ignored the Azorian story altogether until, you know, recently. That's really not the case. Uh, and I know that from a personal level, not only as a long-term member, but due to family history. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Look, at, this is the, this is the Whaling Museum's bulletin. We still produce the bulletin from Johnny Cake Hill. It's a benefit of membership. It's a, we publish a, ma it's a magazine essentially. And here's a couple of issues dating from the 1950s and 60s where they're talking about, of course, Azorian whalemen. And uh, so there is, uh, you know, I mean, it, it would have been hard to ignore the Azorian contribution to uh, American whaling, because that was one of the first stops on a whaling trip. Uh, and, uh, but what was slow to come in were artifacts, uh, in part because they were still, um, you know, uh, heirlooms in families, uh, like that portrait you'll see. We'll see that maybe a little bit later in the gallery. 
Uh, here's a report from the events committee, and if you, if you read right there, look, it says, uh, look, two of them, okay, in cooperation with the Portuguese Educational Society. Well, that's interesting. Most people said, gee, what is that? Well, I, I knew what that was because my Aunt Emily, Amelia, was a secretary of the Portuguese Educational Society uh, in, the, in the 40s. And she was raised, uh, she was born in uh, San Miguel, uh, but r raised here young. And when my, my grandfather came over as a carpenter, he was building housing for the tenements, for the mills, both here and in Fall River. And so he had the means to send her to the Conservatory of Music. She was a church organist. Uh, and uh, piano teacher for many, many years. Uh, and she was involved with some of these programs. Uh, that's actually the Mata Homestead. This house still stands next to the ballpark at Brooklawn Park. And with, in addition to Emily, with nine sons, all of them carpenters, what do you do? You start a construction company, right? So, so it was easy to pay the labor. You just paid them in kale soup, right? You, you didn't have to worry about wages, and so that's, that's what they did. But um, uh, uh, there's my grandmother, and of course she, she came from a little tiny village which actually is being restored by the Azorian government way up above uh, Fael de Terra. Um, it's called Sanguino for the little flowers that grow there, which, uh, oops, let me go back, sorry. Oh, now it works, now it's gonna work, okay these little flowers that grow there, this has been completely restored. It's a remarkable 19th century settlement way up in the ravine. Uh, and, uh, and explains, once I knew this as an adult, it explained a great deal to me about why she was constantly growing flowers, red flowers in particular. So, uh, I was present when, you know, the Azor when the announcement was made by, uh, by the government of Portugal, and it was, a, it was front page news for several days that, um, that the government was going to provide this gift, and it was, it was to the museum, but it was really to the community to, 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 uh, to make permanent the narrative, which was, so, which was so key, really, to not only the development of New Bedford's um, uh, you know, New Bedford in general, but to, to America. It had, a, it had a huge impact in the growth of America. I mean, whaling was an indigenous source of, of wealth. Uh, it came out of the ocean and it was tabulated here and sold from here to world ports. And so uh, at that point, uh, many scholars worked on this uh, and uh, to answer these questions and using the objects that we had in the collection and objects that were given to us and loaned to us, uh, we uh, attempt to answer these questions right here. What are the Azores and where are they? Most people don't know where they are. We see people from around the world, nearly 100,000 a year, and most people really don't know. And what, what, what difference does it make? Well, it ta it, what it does is it teaches a story about how maritime people interact and how, how seagoing nations grow and, and, and how it affects the population, how it changes the nature of both cultures. And they are, we are linked in many ways, um, in my case, uh, directly and personally, but uh, in the greater community, uh, there's an impact in the vibrancy of the community. There's an impact in the cultural, comp you know, the composition and the, the, the contributions. It enriches the community. Uh, you're going to go, we're going to take a walk up there. I can't speak to all of you. I will invite you after this, this overview to come upstairs and see uh, the gallery. Uh, but. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it actually takes up, as I said, half the museum. It's odd in that it's in two pieces on two levels, the upper mezzanine and the lower gallery on the east side of the great ship, the Lagoda. Uh, and uh, uh, it, you know, the panels there are both in English and in Portuguese, uh, so they're bilingual. Uh, so where are they? Uh, most kids want to, you know, will ask that first. Uh, and they're, they're smack dab in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and uh, 
they're not too far in latitude than we are. We're at about, what, 41, I think? We're about 41 north. So as you can see, it's fairly straight shot across. And it back in the age of sail, you really did need a place to stop. Um, and that's one of the reasons it became, the, the Azores became so strategic uh, during the age of sail. It was a place to stop, provision, uh, and, uh, and to, do, to do business. In the case of whaling, uh, provisioning and crew uh, were, were critical. Uh, New Bedford whale masters, whaling masters knew that they could pick up for a fraction of the price uh, young Portuguese boys who weren't afraid of whales, uh, who uh, were expert harpooners, uh, who had no problem standing in boats that were on rolling seas because the Azores are located deep in the, deep in the middle of the ocean, volcanic archipelago here. Um, and, um, uh, and so they, they picked them up. They did went of whaling. They might stop here at, at, right at the end of a four-year voyage, and uh, they could count on a few really homesick guys jumping ship, uh, saying, okay, I see my family on the wharf, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm home, I can't take, no one really loved whaling. I mean, everyone wanted to do it uh, for uh, as little amount of time as they could, but it was the highest risk, highest return business of the 19th century. You didn't need an education, you just needed to be really strong, you needed to work really, really hard, uh, and, um, and really, really long hours, and you could make enough to come home if you were lucky, and if you survived, uh, you make enough to buy a house or a plot of land for a farm. That was really the, that was really the goal. And as I said, if you could do those things, work really hard, long hours, and, and, uh, and be really strong, which is sort of the definition of Azorians generally, um, you, um, uh, you, know, you could make enough to do that. Uh, come home and, and start a life. So uh, the, uh, the archipelago, is nine, archipelago is nine islands and in, in, in generally categorized in, in three groups. The central group, which is where the largest island is, um, I'm sorry, the eastern, the central group is, um, uh, is not the largest island, uh, but it's, it, the central group includes the island of Fayal, uh, and the, the town of Horta uh, is, was sort of the main whaling stop for, for Yankee whalers. Uh, the capital, of course, is over here in San Miguel in the eastern group. And uh, these are charts and maps from uh, the early 19th century. This is an interesting map of Horta Fayal because this, is a, this, this map, it's actually an advertisement. Uh, they, they knew what they were doing. Uh, it's, it's, let me go back again. Uh, here it is, look, it's, it's, it's published. It's, it's like an advertisement because it's trilingual. It's in French, English, and German. And it talks about what a fantastic, you know, port of call this is for business and so forth. Uh, so very early on, there was a lot of, there was a lot of interaction, a lot of maritime commerce. I keep, I'll get these buttons right yet. Let's keep going. Okay, so what's the relationship? Okay, it, this is the essentially the the in a nutshell. Uh, it demonstrates the power of maritime culture that links people, ideas, and traditions. And Melville in Moby Dick, uh, 1851, he notes uh, that uh, the Azorians seem to make the best whalemen. So very early on, and even at, before the height of whaling, this recognition is, um, is made and, and it's memorialized in, uh, okay, a great work like Moby Dick. This, uh, this painting is actually part of an enormous panorama. It's the longest painting in North America. It was it's so actually painted as a, um, as a theater attraction, really. Before, before cinema, before moving pictures, you could go and see a panorama which would be unfurled on giant rolls, about the size of this stage, uh, and it would move along. So this, this panorama would move along, 
as a narrator told you what you were looking at, and there'd be sound effects and music. And, uh, and this panorama is of a whaling voyage around the world in 1848, and it's really a significant document because it was actually painted by a whaleman who went on a voyage and, and painted the various scenes that that whale ship, uh, the Cut-Us-Off, uh, traveled to. And in this case, here he is entering near Fayal, and this is the mountain of Pico, an enormous volcanic uh, precipice that kind of rises out of the ocean. And of course, in making the, of course, that's in, you know, making sight of the Azores, there's, you know, this is from uh, early on. I mean, they, they were struck with this mountain, which was actually, I think it's the tallest mountain in Europe, right? Is that not right, Pedro? Uh, because the Azores are the westernmost border of, of, of Europe. And, um, and so even, even in 1848, the Azores is prominently figured in the narration of whaling. I'll get this right yet. So, unusual name. Uh, people have thought maybe it had to do with blue, you know, azure. Well, it actually has to do with the hawk. So early navigators refer to the hawk islands. They also call them the western islands a little bit later. But Asor, meaning hawk in Portuguese, they're thought to be named after a species of hawk common to the islands. And so, uh, you know, the Azores shows up uh, on these maps. I don't know why I'm getting, let me put this phone away here. There we go. And we see them on, on, on 16th and 17th century maps uh, in a great many places. The Portugal populates the islands, mid 15th century. Prince Henry the Navigator is involved. Uh, it was difficult because, I mean, there were uh, limited resources there. It was considered on the edge of the world. Uh, and um, even, even uh, other groups were invited to populate the islands. The, um, the Flemish influence is still seen in the islands, as is seen here um, in this particular garment. And so there's a, it's really a crossroads. You'll see, you know, you see many a blue-eyed, blonde Azorian uh, for this reason. They practice, I told you that the captains of the New Bedford whale ships, you know, would uh, love to sign aboard for cheap. Uh, you know, a young Portuguese boy who knew how to harpoon a whale wasn't afraid to, uh, because they did it uh, in the Azores uh, from the very beginning, part of subsistence living. They were farmers. If a whale was spotted uh, from a prominent, prominent point, uh, a flare would be sent up, or some kind of signal in the early days, a flag, and the villagers would stop what they were doing in their gardens and fields and run to a a ramp where a boat was, and they'd literally take off after a whale. And this is in, this is off of the, you know, the main sperm whale grounds. And of course, the sperm whale was the whale uh, for, uh, you know, for the preeminent um, uh, illuminating fluid, spermaceti whale oil. So this was an early, here they were, here, here the Azorians are looking for whales, and then they would notify the village. Everyone would stop what they were doing, run down, uh, process the whale on shore. Now, in the Azorian Whaleman Gallery, and this is actually kind of, you can see sort of half of it. There's the upper half here and the lower half. There's a, another part of the panorama. This is actually a reproduction. At the other end of this gallery, we actually have the panorama, which is being conserved right now. You'll see it on a huge table when you go up there. Uh, we're, we're stabilizing some of the pigments on here that have grown um, unstable since 1848. You see this thing here is sort of unusual box. This is actually a, um, uh, uh, it's an approximation of a vizier or a lookout uh, in the 19th century and they are still there. This is one on the, on the western end of Fayal, and you see them, they dot along the roadways. This one, as you can see, it's boarded up. The Azores do not whale anymore, unlike Iceland. They stopped whaling in 85, I believe. It was around 84, 85, right, Pedro? And uh, interestingly enough, when I was there last fall, I mean, the, most of the tourists there were from Europe, many from Germany um, and Britain. 
Uh, and one of the mainstay uh, attractions is whale watching. They, they've gone from hunting whales to watching whales. Um, and, uh, and I went on a Sunday morning and wow, did I see whales like nothing I'd seen out of Plymouth or Hyannis here. An enormous amount of whales just, just outside of the harbor of Fayal. So what we've constructed here, and this was a gift of uh, Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Fraga, uh, is a vizier that kids can come into and get an idea. There's radio equipment in here, and this, uh, this lookout here, this, if you look in here, you'll actually see a whale breaching. And it approximates this vizier story um, of, uh, of lookout whaling and shore-based whaling. So what is the connection the national connection. Why so close? Why, why, you know, in addition to whaling, um, there was another reason. Um, I think it's the second earliest, and I could be wrong about this, maybe Arthur could, <laughs> my, Arthur or Jean might be able to correct me, but uh, the United States was, you know, brand new, and one of the first diplomatic outposts uh, was to the Azores. Uh, and it turns out, I don't know why that's happening. There we go. It turns out that, uh, I'm going to try this again. It turns out that one particular family uh, named by, um, I think it was uh, Jefferson, okay, uh, the, was John Bass Dabney. You can see him over here. He, that's his birth and death dates. He, was, he, he became the consul at Fayal, the U.S. consul. Uh, uh, at Fayal in 1807. And what happened just uh, through the course of history, his son, Charles, became, took over the, took over the consulate. So it was a dynasty uh, of, of consuls, um, first, second, and third generation, which spanned the 19th century pretty much. Um, Samuel Willis Dabney, uh, you know, was I think right up into the late 19th century. The Dabneys finally leave Fayal permanently in the 1890s. They weren't consuls anymore. But over that course of the 19th century, uh, a direct um, presence of the United States involved in commerce uh, was felt at all times. And, and in this case, these were Boston Brahmins. They were very educated, very well connected, uh, and uh, they, were, they were philanthropic. They had, they un, they had a great respect uh, and, uh, for, for their host community, and they, you could say, for political advantage and for humanitarian uh, um, uh, you know, advantage, they, they helped the community in times of great need. Uh, Charles Dabney, and they, these were pro, they were Protestants, needless to say, and of course the Azores are extremely uh, devout Roman Catholic. Roman Catholicism is is uh, is the main religion there, and yet they were highly respected. Charles Dabney, uh, in the middle, uh, saved thousands of Azorians after the the orange crop. They had they, they did have an orange crop there, and there was quite a market um, in Europe for them. And uh, when, they, um, uh, when a, you know, a plague destroyed the crop, there was general famine. People were starving. And he imported wheat uh, from America and rice to, um, uh, to feed the population. Uh, and, and a great many were saved. And he was revered after that. As a matter of fact, they set aside a, the government uh, of Horta, uh, set aside a part of the cemetery for the family. And, um, and install a monument that has a shock of wheat on it because he saved so many. As a matter of fact, many Azorians, probably my family included, might not be here today because uh, you know, if it hadn't been for the Dabneys intervening in times of great strife. That was never forgotten. Um, and from that, I think uh, a general idea was that, the, you know, that this is this is what America means. This is what Americans are like. Uh, and uh, uh, so there was a great deal of um, uh, mutual respect. The other thing, too, about it is uh, when, uh, when there was a movement 
Pedro, correct me, mid-19th century, where, where there was an Iberian movement where Spain and Portugal were going to unite, the Azorians were very against it. And they wrote a letter to, uh, to they wrote a letter to Charles, uh, the local leaders, and they said, we won't become Spaniards. If we, there, before we become Spaniards, we'll become Americans. Make us Americans. Uh, so the joke that the Azores are sort of America's 51st state kind of begins early, <laughs> early on. Uh, there was always an affinity to come to America. Because let's face it, you're in the middle, and if you've ever been, have any one of you been to the Azores? A few? It's really, oh, this, that's quite a majority. Uh, there, if you're up on a hill, there isn't any spot where, uh, the way up, there, is, there are many spots where you can see ocean all the way around you. If you turn in 360 degrees, you, you get a feeling of just how isolated you are. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, and it was, it was very hard life. I mean, one of the reasons kale uh, is considered here, now it's a, you know, now it's a, the, what's the word? It's the, uh, it's the health plant de jour right now, right? It's in everything. But one of the reasons it sort of became associated with the Azores locally is because it was the only damn thing that could grow. Uh, you know, it was that hardy. Um, and, uh, you know, making wine was almost as more arduous because they had to build microclimate stone walls to shield and import dirt to shield the, the vines. But, um, uh, but, the, uh, but the Azurians saw America as a way to build a new, a, a new life. And uh, oddly enough, in my, in my family's case, there were two brothers. My grandfather came and his brother stayed and they actually made out better. <laughs> <laughs> they, they stayed and they, they did fine. Um, so they're linked through commerce early in U.S. history. Like I said, 1807 is pretty early, uh, even for New Bedford. I mean, New Bedford's a village in 1807, and yet uh, international commerce is being conducted through the Dabney Consulate. Uh, and uh, this is, look, at this is a letter from no less than John Avery Parker, uh, telling his, um, you know, telling his whaling master that should you obtain any oil previous to passing the Western Islands, and that was the other name, the, you know, the Yankee name for the Azores, uh, land at Fayal, leaving it with Mr. Dabney, okay, to be shipped to this country. So he held things, uh, uh, and uh, there wasn't any part of commerce they were involved in. Of course, back then, you could be a dip, you could be you know a consul and a diplomat and be a full fledged businessman. There were there were no rules about uh, conducting commerce, um, and so they they also grew quite wealthy, more wealthy than when they were of course in Boston. This was the consulate uh, called Bagatelle uh, at that time. Uh, you can see the the terraced gardens. It was really quite. Uh, a remarkable, beautiful estate. And the building still exists. Um, oh, okay, I'm gonna give up on this button. I'm gonna just use the tablet here. The, uh, the building still exists. Actually, Pedro and I were there last, uh, last fall, and we saw the ruins of Bagatelle. There it is. Um, and it's in the process of restoration now. Uh, it, I guess it had been in a state of uh, ruined for about 20 years, uh, kind of, you know, in p private hands. Uh, and, uh, but now it's in the process of being restored. And again, related to ecotourism and cultural tourism, the government is establishing a Dabney Trail uh, where you can learn about the relationship between this international, this long-term international relationship between two nations through the Dabney narrative. Uh, along a, a trail. It's really quite remarkable. Um, shameless plug here. I was the American copy editor for um, an, an anthology of all of their diplomatic papers. Sounds dry, but uh, in fact, uh, it actually took up three volumes. This is a soft cover book. But in fact, the narratives of the Dabneys have the names of, I mean, everybody passed through those islands in the 19th century. It was really kings and 
authors and scholars, um, you name it, they came through. And uh, it's revealed in the papers uh, of, of the, Dabney, uh, the Dabney Consul. Uh, very interesting reading. It, it could be a movie, actually. And the plug is it's for sale in the store. So, but, uh, so look at the American whale ships in uh, Fayal in Horta Harbor. Uh, they were so many going back and forth, they literally formed a bridge of whale ships. And it's in quotes because the person who coined that, Dr. Mary Vermette, um, she was an early advocate of uh, a whaleman gallery, an Azorian whaleman gallery in, uh, in New Bedford uh, to tell this story. And we'll talk about her in a, in a minute. Uh, but she was a dear friend and she's been gone now for a, a good 10 years, uh, maybe a little less. But uh, Mary was a tireless advocate of this narrative. And a mar you know, the, these were, these were died in the wool mariners. And so when Charles Dabney's, you know, w introduces the first Yankee whaling techniques to the island, they take note and they start adapting their boats uh, to, uh, to Yankee whaling techniques. And of course, they increase their quotas of whales at the islands, improving their economy as well. We'll talk about that. Briefly, look at there. There's a group of Azorians with a. That's certainly more of a. You can see it's it's more of a, a Yankee whale boat here. And as this caption says, um, they continued the the Azorian boat builders continued to um, adapt this Yankee whale boat design to their own waters, which were much rougher. Uh, the Yankee uh, whale boat is a. Uh, a wider in the beam vessel, and the Azorian whale boat, which we'll see in a minute. Again, part of the cultural contribution is a very sleek, lots of sail. Uh, it's actually quite unstable for someone who doesn't know how to handle boats. Gives you an eye, and they go, they go uh, three times as fast uh, as a Yankee whale boat. So commerce was the reason. We had uh, all types of commerce going on back and forth in the Whaling Museum's collection and upstairs there are some examples of countless um, you know, interactions, um, business interactions, whether it was in provisioning, whaling, um, you name it. Uh, uh, there was uh, commerce going back and forth between the, between the islands and America, principally New Bedford and Fayel. And the seamen, the Azorian mariners who were picked up there, uh, uh, who didn't get off the boat because they were sick, because they were, in, uh, because they were homesick and saw their family. They were informed by the whaling captain, we can't pay you. They, well, but pay me, I'm home. Sorry, no, no money on the ship. You have to come back to New Bedford. Uh, we have to make an accounting of how much whale oil, what the market bears, and in the counting house, we'll figure out what your share is. And uh, they could always count on a few jumping ship because they just couldn't take it anymore. And of course, they would assume that pay but just as many uh, would not w dare work for f four years and not be paid, they'd say, I'm going back to New Bedford, I'll be paid, and I'll take the next boat back home. But they didn't. Here they stayed. And they accumulated, and they found other work, and they brought family, wrote to family, and family came back, back here to, to, you know, uh, to make a new life. This is a sea chest up there. Look, you can see it's Manny Mendoza. Is that what it is right there? Right? Uh, look, at, look at the pride involved in, uh, this is actually a painting he did inside his chest of New Bedford Harbor. Uh, so the connection between Azorian uh, and Yankee whalemen became very blurred by the end of the 19th century. Um, as a matter of fact, by the end of the 19th century, there's all, uh, almost no Yankees involved in whaling. Uh, they were all, even the, ship, even the ship owners were Portuguese, were uh, uh, an Azorian. Um, and then the Cape Verdean uh, crew were also involved in late, uh, late in the whaling era. And the community here changed, uh, like in Fall River. Actually, Fall River is more Azorian than, a, than New Bedford is now, I believe. Uh, and and I, I noticed the difference in the, in the differences in the feshtas. Uh, the, you know, the, the feasts that are here typically are more secular. The ones in Fall River tend to be more religious. And the ones um, you know, on the islands are 
very religious. Um, and uh, the objects are venerated in a way that is, um, you don't see here anymore. Although I remember it as a child. Uh, of course, this is one of the great ch Portuguese churches in the South End, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Uh, South Water Street was a large retail district and very Portuguese. Uh, and of course, like in Fall River, we have, we have many cultural groups that, that perform and, uh, uh, and create a vibrant community. Uh, and I, I think the thing that links, uh, this is my personal opinion, um, from this heritage, is, uh, is the religious continuity that the Nine Islands had. Um, it's interesting, too. There's a lot of interesting uh, theological kind of parallels. You've got Nine Islands, like a novena, okay? Uh, very devoted to, in Roman Catholic dogma, uh, the, the third person of the Trinity, you know, of the Trion God, the, tri, the Trion God, which is the, in, in Roman Catholic dogma is the Holy Spirit. And um, uh, in Greek and in Latin, that's the parakletos, which means the advocate, the provider, the, the safe keeper. And so why would that be so profound? It was actually, even the Azorians call this, in, in actually in translation, a cult. Uh, but uh, here you are on these little islands. Uh, you really get a feeling of how small you are. And, and they're volcanic. They're constantly shaking beneath your feet. So uh, the idea that you had an advocate, you had a protector, um, you know, in the Trion God, uh, in the third person of the Trinity was really important. And uh, this crown is, uh, uh, is representative of that um, and of Saint uh, Queen Isabella, who was, a, uh, uh, who was a named saint and known for her charity. Uh, and the festas are still religious. Interestingly enough, the Catholic Church, um, it's separate. They, these, these crowns are kept in their own separate houses in the village square, not within the church, because it's actually not part of the ecclesiastical, um, what's the word, uh, aspect of the, of the church. It's not part of the mass. It's, it, but it is, a, it is a, a devout following, and I think it has to do with the uncertainty of living on a place that can be that inhospitable. So, uh, uh, so religion and faith figured very prominently. I think it, 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 it's the one thing that this symbol, in particular for me anyway, unites the Nine Islands. As I was saying, the, the Azorians, um, the Portuguese, and then later the Cape Verdeans essentially take over whaling, really, by the end of the 19th century. They own the ships, they run them, they're the agents, uh, and we've got a few examples here. Uh, Anton Silva, okay, so very early, look, 1890. Um, He's bringing, he's actually got a business. He's bringing uh, immigrants over uh, on his own ships. Um, and his packet ship, Veronica, we, there's a portrait of it uh, by a really prominent um, marine artist. The figurehead of the ship, an eagle, uh, is, uh, is upstairs as well. Uh, these guys weren't weren't small potatoes. Um, the agents like Sylvia, look at, they, they, they were in all kinds of business. Um, but uh, let me see if I have a few more examples. Here, here, here he is again uh, with his officers and crew um, on the Greyhound, really important whale ship in New Bedford history. Another one, uh, Antonio Cavello, um, again, early. He's first mate, he works with Sylvia. I'm, I'm using Sylvia as an example, but there are many. And, and within the collection, we have many paintings re related to ships that were owned or, or managed or mastered uh, by the Portuguese. So the documents that we have within the collection really um, established the connections in, in dollars and cents about how, you know, about, about 
the international commerce that took place, which grew both places. Uh, I think it actually benefited New Bedford more than the Azores in many ways because uh, New Bedford had land connections to interior markets. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it didn't stop the wave of immigration, at which, became, which became even greater during the textile era. Um, there's Mary. So Dr. Vermette, uh, she was a tireless. She never, she never stopped keeping after this museum. She said, when are you going to make sure that within your galleries you tell the real story of whaling? Um, that uh, that the, reason, the reason New Bedford looks the way it does, the way Fall, even Fall River, because of course it was whaling money in part that helped to finance the textile industry in Fall River. Uh, railroad, textiles, timber, that was all money invested from whaling. And she said, when, when, when is the museum, in order for the museum to really claim its role as a, as a, as a regional, uh, you know, as a regional center for um, the story of, um, you know, uh, of national growth, you really have to tell this story. And she was involved in the, uh, right up to the, you know, right, right up to the national government involved in making sure that the, the U.S. Um, authorities in Washington, D.C., uh, Senator Kennedy and uh, Barney Frank and others understood this, this important narrative. And part of that was to also talk about the craftsmanship and the artisanship of the, of the Azorians. And uh, just this is a fairly recent photograph. This is Joao Tavaz from Pico, uh, master boat builder of Azorian whale boats. Uh, the, whale, uh, the whaleman gallery has, has this model. It's a half-scale model of an Azorian whale boat, but we also own two Azorian whale boats, uh, one of which he produced here on site maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and there's some of his crew. Uh, this gentleman was, uh, came from the islands and interned with him to learn how to build these boats and there's some of our volunteers. Uh, and of course, you may see them in New Bedford Harbor. Here they are. Look, there's the twin spires of Mount Carmel. This was a couple of Julys ago. You can see how these guys are hiked over. I mean, look at the enormous amount of sail on an Azorian whaleboat. I mean, you re really have to know what you're doing. Uh, even and this is fairly, this is calm water compared to the com compared to the Azores. I was out there on the whale watch on a calm Sunday morning, and uh, it was it was rough. So you imagine striking a whale on this thing, in addition to handling handling the boat. This has become an important international uh, ongoing um, program uh, that, uh, the, that the two nations share. Um, and, uh, and it's a way to create additional uh, links with our communities. Um, every couple of years, they come and we, have, we just we had one in 2013 here, and uh, it's, the Azorians kill us in this thing, by the way. We, I don't think we want a single heat. Uh, they are so good at it. But we try, and we learn. Uh, but uh, the Dabney, it's so named for the Dabneys. This is a new international um, uh, sailing competition using these really unusual, rare, uh, beautifully made boats. Uh, there's the half-scale model and the Dabney Cup trophy on display. With the um, with the uh, Whaleman Gallery's uh, dedication tablet from the government of Portugal, and um, and I think that's more than enough.